friends, welcome back to Not Again, the podcast that brings college-level analysis to preschool-level content. I'm one of your hosts, Rebecca. I'm your other host, Alan. And your mini-host is Ari, who's here with us again today. Um, Just get used to that. I haven't had any complaints so far. Uh, Today, despite our tagline, we are uh, going to break a little bit from tradition to talk about stuff that might not be preschool-level content. Um, Some of it actually is very very, very much not preschool level content, um, because we thought it'd be cool to talk about um, our experience with autism as it's portrayed in the media, mm-hmm. um, any entertainment uh, medium I included. So I have books, I have one web comic, I have TV shows, and I have movies. Um, and I thought we could just talk about that and, you know, good portrayals, bad portrayals, um, you know, and, and it seemed like it would be wise to start with our story. In brief. So to give some background, our older son, Warren, is uh, going to be four in January, and he was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when he was two. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that we were able to tell that was he started talking and then very suddenly stopped. Yeah. He um, started gaining words and then regressed. Yeah. And we were yeah. pretty sure that that was supposed to go in one direction only mm-hmm. and that backwards was not a good sign. Um, and so we got his hearing checked and we, you know, took him to a clinic and the child psychologist took a look at the way that he was communicating with us and she gave us that diagnosis. And I think that it just made me so much more aware of when, you know, autism spectrum disorder is portrayed right, or coded as it is in yeah. a lot of characters. So in, in a lot of characters, it's, it's sort of implied rather than outright. Yeah, and I mean, we'll we'll get to this next time, but um, the the show Big Mouth, which apparently has caused a lot of controversy, I can tell why, I suppose. But um, the only thing I really care about is they have a character named Caleb who is on the spectrum, but he's introduced as I, I, I'm going to get the exact quote later, but he's introduced as that weird kid who can't read people's emotions. You know what I mean? It's yeah. very strange that they they are uncomfortable using the term autistic considering they are perfectly capable and comfortable yeah. with making fun of him for being autistic, right? And so we'll get to that later. So we're just going to um, go through some stuff and, and talk about it. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, the first thing that I want to tell you about is The Life We Bury by Alan Eskins. Now, he spells it the way that uh, everybody always thinks your name is spelled. So he spells oh. it A-L-L-E-N. Yes. Um, and you're A-L-A-N, which is the way that I always spell out. I always thought A-L-L-E-N was the last name. Me too. I mean, Not know. the first name. I learn something new every day, I guess. Um, and so this is a book for some context that we gave to our students as a choice for kind of an independent novel study in our junior year English class. And I will I will introduce the a couple caveats. Number one, I have not finished reading it because I had to rage quit, um, as you'll hear why in a second. The other is my students largely enjoyed it. And any book that a student enjoys, in my estimation, is a, a book that is worth you know keeping in the classroom and whatever. I think that the way that I would introduce it in future is just to tell them, like, hey, I don't like this portrayal of autism, but, you know, with that in mind, you might enjoy it. Okay. So, um, and I'm going to be doing a lot of talking about this one. We're going to kind of switch off a little bit and do back and forths when it's appropriate, but I've read the few pages, and I wanted to share some of my thoughts with you. The Life We Bury is about a a 21-year-old bouncer named Joe uh, who is going to do a school report about uh, a a war veteran who blah, blah, blah mystery. Um, It's a really good mystery. Again, my students loved it. But I'm only going to focus in on the treatment of autism. So so Joe's mother is bipolar and uh, an alcoholic, and his little brother, Jeremy, is autistic. And at first I was like, okay, like, at least they're naming it that. Like, a lot of the shows we're going to talk about is they they code these characters autistic without ever saying it. So at least they're coming right out and saying he is autistic. But the fact of the matter is that this character is being portrayed, Joe is being portrayed as having, like, oh, how do I say this? Like, oh, man, I got family troubles, you know what I mean? Do you know, uh, yeah, okay. So it's mostly just to, like, give him more kind of uh, 
characterization. So the, the autism diagnosis of his brother isn't treated as like its own thing or as a problem his brother has. It's coded. It's a burden for him. It's a burden for him. Exactly. As the neurotypical person. So it's just like, oh, look at all these problems I have. Not like this is, you know, like how do, like, do we ever really figure out what his brother feels about it? Well, that, that I don't know because I'm hoping the brother has his own character arc, but I'm very scared that he's going to be used simply as kind of like a prop. A, a prop exactly for the the main character because the 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 impetus for some of the plot is his mother gets arrested and he has to take his autistic brother to his apartment and um like and it, and it's just portrayed so much like oh poor me look at my family life like uh I have to deal with this and 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 so it's not off to a great start and then on top of that I have a quote here from chapter 3 it's page 23 of my copy they're in the car and Joe narrator says Jeremy grew more comfortable with our adventure until finally he relaxed with a deep exhale, the way I've seen dogs sigh in that moment when vigilance surrenders to sleep. And that's when I stopped reading for a while. I think I managed to get a couple more pages in and then I stopped again. I, yeah. yeah. So how do I say this? Simile and analogy, totally okay to use. They are literary devices that help enrich the experience for the reader. But when you are specifically taking an autistic person and using a dog as a comparison, that creates problems. Yeah, it's, it, it's dehumanizing. It's, it's dehumanizing. Yeah. It, it, uh, uh, when he finally re- relaxed in the car, it was like... It was like a, a dog It was relaxing. like a dog giving up. And my best friend pointed out that, like, dog's size sound just, just like yeah. people's size. <laughs> just um, normal size, really. So, like, why specifically did you decide to make it a dog size? It's almost like you want us to draw an association with the behavior of animals and the behavior of an autistic person. And this guy, he loves his descriptors and his creative writing. One of my major, con- like, uh, criticisms of the book is that the main character asserts from page one... I can flip it open right now. Page one, oddly enough, my high school guidance counselor never mentioned the word college. Like, he keeps portraying himself as um, kind of uneducated, like, works on the streets, you know, like, doesn't really, isn't into academia, but the academia, I guess, academia nuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, but he but he uses descriptors like grandeur and panache, panache, I think. Whatever. And uh, he... he his diction is that of an incredibly well-educated person. Mm. Like, I hear the author's voice in this narrator's voice, if that makes sense. Yeah. Not to say that people who haven't gone to college cannot speak well. That is not what I'm saying at all. But if he's trying to portray a character who is trying to kind of give off the vibe of, I don't care about academics, I'm not good at academics, like, whatever, man. They typically speak in a certain way, and that doesn't Just make... more colloquial. Colloquially, yeah. exactly. And that doesn't make their story any less important. At all. It just makes yeah. it more believable for the character. And honestly, it's it's less pretentious and sometimes easier and more fun and even more literary to read somebody who's just speaking Yes, you want people clearly. to relate to this character, right? And people don't yeah. talk like they're constantly, you know, doing a lecture at Harvard or whatever. So, like, I mean, some people do, but, like, not everybody. And so if you want to make it relatable, you know, having a more conversational tone, it makes more sense. So, anyway, so I already forgot where I was going with this. But, yeah, so so he, oh, yeah, he likes his descriptions. So, so the author clearly likes his literary devices, his descriptions. And I think he, he I hope he just thought that he was you know, using an, a descriptive piece of imagery. This is this is a total tangent, and I'm going to use my catchphrase as we're going to cut this out. But we're not. But we're not. Uh, we'll see, depending on how bad it is. There's kind of this, this process that I went through as a technical writer where when you're a undergraduate, you're trying to write like you're a graduate student, and when you're a graduate student, you're trying to write like you're at a postdoc level, and when you're a postdoc... You're trying to write so that graduate students can understand you. And when you're a professor, you're trying to write like undergraduates can understand you. And so uh, this that, that, that reaching, like I'm going to use the most clever thing that I can think of to kind of impress somebody is actually a little bit juvenile. Oh, that's an interesting way to put yeah, it. Because yeah, because it's almost like they're, he's trying to impress us. Yeah, he's trying to he's impress the reader. Like, oh, look at this turn of phrase I can turn. It's like, it's, that's not the clearest way you could have written it. That's right. not that's not the way that would have been, that, that, that that's the most understandable or, or even like just the best way to say it. 
uh, to a to a to a uh, an intellectual person or something like that. It's just unclear because you're trying to like force something. And what I want to get down to is a lot of people kind of have this idea in their head of like an autistic person can't possibly relate to me or understand me. The, the dehumanization is a really dangerous, I mean, dangerous or stereotypical thing to have in mind. And to reinforce that with a dog comparison is very problematic to me. Um, I will say a couple more uh, like caveats. One, I don't know Alan Eskins as a person. I did not look into him at all other than to see that he was is very well educated. And so he might have uh, a person on the spectrum in his life. And so maybe he... Uh, you know, has more familiarity with it and would push back on us saying that he is being insensitive to it. I don't know. This is just my impression. And he's already selling the book a lot. And so he shouldn't worry about little old me. The other thing is my husband, Alan, and I are not psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, doctors, medical doctors. Alan is a PhD doctor. So we're not experts on psychology or autism spectrum disorder at all. We're going to talk solely about our impressions of it as as it relates to kind of raising a son on the spectrum. And so and everybody's experience is different, mm-hmm. hence the word spectrum. Yeah, it's a spectrum disorder. So like when we our experience and what we know firsthand, uh depiction of it that's, you know, more one side, more the other side, we might go like, I don't really know if I quite understand that. And it, it could just be that that's just somewhere else on the spectrum that we haven't really encountered. Right. So. so don't take advice from, like, don't take medical advice from us. Don't take psychology advice from us. That's not the point of this. It's just an exploration of a topic um, and over analyzing it. That's what we do. That's what we do. So that's the life we bury. And that is so far, I, I do plan to finish reading it because when I introduce it to a student, I like to say I have read this book and so that I can give them an honest review of it. Um, so I will probably will finish it, but I don't like the portrayal so far. I'm really hoping the brother has an arc of his own. And there are a couple other books on the list. One of them is literally a book written for people on the spectrum. It's called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. It takes place in England. Um, and it is a wonderful journey told from the perspective of a young man on the spectrum who has quite severe, who's quite severely on the spectrum. So he has, um, a lot to overcome in his journey. And he does it. Mark Haddon is the author and he does just such such a great job making it engaging and allowing someone like me, who is neurotypical to see from the perspective of somebody on the spectrum. And it's, it's helped me so much, especially with Warren. So I'd really recommend that one. I just want to say that that one's a really good book. Um, and another thing about it is that it points out, while I will never attempt to own, take ownership of the Black Lives Matter movement or say like, oh, I know exactly how they feel because I am white and no, I don't. Having a son on the spectrum does make me feel some of that fear when it comes to authority figures. Oh, yeah. Because what if he doesn't know the right cues to respond to when yeah. he's older and right. he encounters okay. somebody so, who doesn't know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So many of those kind of high stress situations, how those kind of interactions work. Uh, even in lower stress situations, lower than a than a, a, a police encounter, can go wrong, and you could come up with a wrong uh, result. But in a, in a in a life and death sort of situation, like that, I have, I have fear about yeah, it. Yeah, I fear about it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and I mean, like I just um, I want to say, like we do not know. The the one thing that we've been told over and over again is we do not know. We do not know yeah. what he's going to look like two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. He could. He could be able to assimilate quite well with neurotypical people, or he could have, I don't know what to call it, more, more hangups. I, I don't yeah, well, want to sound he, disparaging. Yeah, he might have to be in a, in a in a more controlled environment where the people around him understand what he what he's going what, through, what yeah. he's going through as so, opposed to being in the general. You know, pop, general pop, school system, yeah. general population, pop, whatever. Yeah, I mean, like, we're not going to lock him up or anything, but, no, like, yeah. but No, 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 I'm just, they I'm, just, have I'm kind telling of our listeners more that we're not planning on enclave situations yes, for people who for are sure. And so, and so all we've been told is, like, don't, you know, all of this is conjecture right now. Like, he's he's not not yet very verbal, and we we have no way of knowing if he is going to yes. be fully verbal ever. Like, his, it's just a lot of guesswork. Yeah, his one word kind of naming thing vocabulary is growing by leaps and bounds, but whole stringing together whole concepts and saying like, this is what I want to happen right now. Yeah. That's not, that's not forming at the same rate. Right. And so, um, you know, that's so, and so the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime starts out with a police encounter. And I think people who have neurotypical children might 
understand the fear that I have if they read yeah. that and realize, oh yeah, like th- this is something to worry about. And so I do, I do feel some of that same fear and Black Lives Matter. Well, um, and 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 uh, there are stories out there I, of just people who are hearing impaired or deaf, and they get pulled over. They're allowed to drive. Like you don't need your ears to drive. Right. And uh, you know, and they get pulled over, and all of a sudden, it's it's a big hairy deal. Yeah, they did that on Switched at Birth. Yeah, it's a it's a show with with people who are hard of hearing and deaf, and and the police had, uh, encountered yeah. a deaf young man, and and it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, not to cut you off, but um, so to get through the books, um, we also have the perks of being a wallflower, which is a movie, and I very rarely say this. I really like the movie adaptation of that book. I watch it a lot. Um, so take that mm-hmm. how you will. Um, the perks of being a wallflower is one of those coded autistic ones. He yep. does not. The narrator, the narrator, the narrator Charlie is not openly, openly autistic. He's well, not. It, it, yeah, it's not like that. But he's not described as being autistic. So when we talk about coding autistic, we look at does this person understand typical social reactions and situations? Can they read other people's emotions? Do they respond appropriately to um, high stress situations or emotional situations? Um, do they have a flat affect sometimes is a thing flat affect. It just means not emoting as much with your face. Um, and so there are so many characters as we're going to talk about that are coded this way that never once, um, Mm -hmm. you know, have that acknowledgement that like I'm on the spectrum and that's fine, you know? Yeah. And so perks of being a wallflower is one of them where the, the character is, he goes through a character arc and he has relationships and he has trauma and all of that. And it's an engaging book and I love it. I just wish, like I do with all these things, that they would go one step further and just own it and say, yeah, I'm on the spectrum and I have friends and I have traumas and I have an emotional growth and a character arc and everything like that. Still a really good book. And, uh, and, and moving further back in time, uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is A Wrinkle in Time, which I'm not going to talk about the movie because that one was a bad adaptation of the book. But the book features a young woman named Meg who has a little brother named Charles Wallace. I didn't fact check this, so I hope I'm right about that. Um, it's been a while since I've read it, but I used to read it so many times when I was younger. Um, and uh, Charles Wallace is on the spectrum, but again, it's not um, – I don't – like, I don't remember when, when – well, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. First published in 1962. 1962. Yeah. So yeah, autism spectrum disorder probably wasn't fully uh, yeah. described at that point. Right. So I, I could be wrong on that, but I imagine that we've made a few advancements on the diagnosis yes. of autism spectrum disorder since 1962. Well, even today, we're constantly learning new things about yeah. it, and so it's it, you know it's a it's an ongoing learning experience for society and everything. Yeah. Um, but in 1962, they probably didn't have a word for it, so I can't be like, oh, why didn't she label him? But he, I, I distinctly remember that he was considered odd by people who knew him because he did not start talking until he was, I think, three or something like that, right? And that's a common uh, Mm -hmm. result of being on the spectrum. Like, Warren is not... Uh, as verbal, like we just said. And so, yeah. And um, as far as his treatment goes, he is an integral part of the plot. He's a very sweet character. He has his own wants and needs. I think that he's treated quite well overall. Again, the movie did fine, whatever, but like um, the more recent movie, but uh, I think the book did okay with that. Um, And so those are books. And I know, I guess this isn't as funny of an episode, so I hope people still find this interesting. But those are the books. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is a webcomic called Questionable Content, which you know a little bit about. I do. Um, Questionable Content, I have things to say. Um, I love the webcomic. I do. It's it's called Questionable Content, but it doesn't usually get into like too raunchy of stuff. There's like not like frequent nudity or anything like that. Um, But... I I still don't know how to pronounce. I tried tweeting at him. I don't think he responds to tweets. I think it's it's either Jeff Jacques or Jeff Jacques or Jeff Jake. I don't know. Um, Sometimes it's Jake's depending if you're English enough. I don't know how to do French anyway. Um, But he's the creator and questionable content is like, this is both a positive and a negative. It's kind of like a, he, he just wants to have one of everybody, if that makes sense. So there, so he wants to be as inclusive as possible. So there is a trans woman, there's, uh, people who are all over the LGBTQ spectrum. So there's a gay couple, um, that, well, not even a gay couple. So a, a lesbian woman with a bisexual woman. Um, there is, there are robots. There's just sentient, there's AI in this universe. Um, and there's a, there's an AI, uh, plus woman relationship and spoiler alert. Um, and, and so, and then, 
But on top of that, like, it took him a long time to include a person of color. And when he did, he just, like, jokingly made... A, so, like, one of the main settings of the, the comic is there's a coffee shop called Coffee of Doom. And he made another similar coffee shop where every character kind of had, like, a mirror world version of themselves, but they were they were black. Um, so they were, they were all people of color. And it, it was almost like that means that they don't have identities... Uh, they, were, Se- they weren't separate. They weren't separate from the characters that already existed. Yeah, they were introduced as like a laugh of like being opposites of white characters. Yeah. And yes, they got their own storylines eventually, but it was a kind of awkward way to introduce people of color to your all white <laughs> cast. Um, and uh, yeah, but there is one new character, so he's trying to be as inclusive as possible. Her name is Brunhilda, and she goes by Brune, and she is on the spectrum. And I. I am mostly okay with the treatment of her character. Um, I think that the only the only thing that I would sometimes wince at a little bit is that, like like with Big Mouth, which we'll talk later, anytime the fact that they're on the spectrum becomes the butt of the joke, if that makes sense, yeah. it, 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 it toes the line a little bit. He tries his best to be you know, supportive and, um, inclusive and everything like that. And I, and and I can tell there's no ill will behind it. Um, but for the most part, yeah, she's, she has her own character arc. She has friends, um, and, and she's treated quite well. I, I wouldn't say that this is problematic by any means. And that moves us on to being done with books and web comics, I think. Um, yeah. Not, well, there's one web comic. I don't think we uh, th- we might have to do a little fancy editing here, but there was a web comic that we both liked to the point that we bought him a cup of coffee. Oh, that's right, with um um st- Stimmy Kitty. Yeah, that was it. Yes, uh, I'm very grateful to Alan for reminding me that we found good comic. Good good comic is <laughs> we found good. a good comic. Yes, and we bought them a Kofi, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna go with he him pronouns. I believe. Um, I believe that's what we got. His name is Steve Asbel. Asbel? Asbel. I'll go with Asbel. It's uh, A-S-B-E-L-L. And he uh, is is on the spectrum. He's hashtag actually autistic. And he has a website, steveasbel.com, where he does... Oh, he or they. There we go. There you go. Um, So I'm going to say he because I've been going with it. I don't have a problem with they, though. It says or. Yeah. Yeah. And he has a comic about... Autism, and it's called Stimmy Kitty, or at least the character is. It's on his website, and it's just it's it's so beautiful, and and I and so I, I, this is usually an insult, but it's it's honestly a compliment. It's so simple that I can understand like where he's coming from. Like it's another thing, like uh, the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime that lets me see through my son's eyes. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times people go like, oh, if it's more complicated, it's more nuanced. But every once in a while. Uh, you get a really simple comic and you go, oh, that's what that is. And like it just like it just cuts through all of that. Like, yeah. Yeah. It and so it's very nice. Bit. I really like it. Yeah. I'm, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to like post this one to Twitter at some point on our account. When, maybe like when the episode goes up. Yeah. Or as a preview to the episode. I love this one. The one where she's like rocking oh, yeah, and like but, the beautiful backgrounds. And then and then these people are saying it's, it's sad that she's on the spectrum. But like clearly she's, she's in having her the com- best time. She's in her comfort We place. all have a comfort zone, right? Yeah. And like seeing that. Oh, God, I love this. Guys, you need to check him out. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a really, really good portrayal. And I'm so glad you remembered. And the editing nightmare. But, you know, I love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, check out Steve. And uh, yeah, so I, I think that that really gets us through kind of calm, like the written word is what I wanted to do first. And you can certainly let us know if we missed anything. I, yeah. I mean, we're we're trying to go through a compre- comprehensive list, but we're also trying to keep this to two episodes so we can go back to tearing apart the things that children love um, because we're such good people. And uh, so, yeah, I think that it makes, does it make logical sense, would you say, to start with movies or to start with TV shows? Um, I think... TV shows just because, like, they're usually one episode, like, one-off characters or something like that. Yeah. And so that might be a little bit more bite-sized and then go into movies, which is be a bit longer. Yeah, I think that's good. I kind of I kind of mix them up and jumble them up, but that's fine. Um, so let's look at this. So so because we are almost at our time, yeah. um, I, I like the idea of 30 minutes. Me too. Um, and I want to do some shout-outs and stuff like that. Um, let's, let's kind of preface what we're going to talk about next time. So... You are going to watch an episode of House, 
Uh, oh, yeah. You've watched it in preparation, but I haven't. So I still right. need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's face it. We've both seen that episode mm-hmm. at least once. Um, it's it's. I have a very love-hate relationship with House. I can't look away, but I also am so angry at the show and its medical ethics or lack yeah, thereof. Yeah. But um, there's one episode of House that features a, a young man. I keep saying young man and young woman. I'm sorry. I just don't remember ages, which is why I keep saying, because that's like such a catch-all term. Sure. But it features a boy who's on the spectrum in season three. So you're going to watch that and you're going to tell me a little bit about that. Um, and it's so interesting to have this perspective. Like I was telling my friends, like when I was reading the life we bury, if I'd read this four years ago or longer, I don't think that I would have even paused at any of the autistic stuff. Like, I think that I, I've learned so much, especially if you're reading something just to like get through it for kind of like work. Yeah. You just go like this part, skip it, skip it, you know, like just kind of speed reading through it. I know I would have. Well, this one's actually supposed to be entertaining, which is why I'm so happy that the kids liked it. Like finally English teachers are realizing like, oh, maybe students would read more if we gave them books that aren't the Scarlet Letter. Um, You know, so um, yeah. So I, I, so these things I like, I saw the house episode, but this was before Warren. Mm-hmm. So now I'm curious how my perspective will change now that we have Warren. Will well, I still this would be interesting portrayal? for me because I remember that episode more than other episodes. And it kind of, it, it struck me odd. It struck you as odd. Uh, yeah. The way and that it was. I, I thought yeah. it was a little bit uh, strange. And I, I, I mean, now going back at it, I might think it did a better job than I remember or a worse job than I remember. Yeah. But yeah, I rem- that one stuck out in my memory is like, mm, I don't really know about like this. Yeah. It, it seemed, seems it seemed, hokey. It seemed kind of which would be, slapdash. Which would make sense for the show because yeah. as many people have said, it's not factually accurate a lot of the time. Um, so you're going to talk about that. I'm going to talk. I think that a great opener would be to talk about Scrubs. I don't know if you remember, but there's one episode where Dr. Cox's friend comes to visit and his son is on the spectrum Mm -hmm. and Dr. Cox gives him the diagnosis. So I think that'd be a good time to, good thing to talk about to start with. Well, you've seen a lot more scrubs than me, but uh, the the pathology guy, the the mortician guy, is he coded? Oh, we would have to talk about that. Okay. Tune in next time to see. I've only seen half of that show. Yeah. Doug, so she knows I don't. Yeah. Um, So we're going to also talk about Criminal Minds. That would be Dr. Reed on Criminal Minds. Gilmore Girls, Kirk. um, And then according to my best friend, Rory. Hmm, We would have to explore that one. Uh, Stranger Than Fiction, Will Ferrell plays Harold Crick, and he's coded autistic. We are going to avoid the Big Bang Theory like Plague. Big Mouth, um... All our robotic characters we really need to talk to, talk to, talk to. I would love to talk to Data. Are you kidding me? Data's my fave. No, talk about Janet from The the Good Place and Data from Star Trek The Next Generation and Seven of Nine from Star Trek Voyager. And then a typical on Netflix, I'm going to try to watch that. I've heard bad things from people who know, people who are actually autistic. Uh, the Good Doctor, uh, yeah. Community uh, is a good rep- representation uh, Bob's Burgers, Tina from Bob's, Bob's Burgers, and Power Rangers, that new one that came out a while back that everyone hated, but I loved. Yeah, I thought it was fun. I had such a good time with that. So that's all coming up, maybe, if we have time. Otherwise, we're going to have to pick and choose. And I'm going to close the show by saying thank you very much to everyone on Twitter who has been so supportive of me and my reviews, my little doodles and, and just kind of like everyone's, I just, I'm, I, I have no words. Um, I recently did a guest spot with Jesse Jackson, but not the Jesse Jackson. Who is Jesse Jackson? I can't Jesse remember. Jackson was a former presidential candidate and community organizer. Thank you. Uh, he, he was in one of my podcast reviews for how many, and he, uh, invited me on to do a guest spot with him on his podcast, Set Lusting Bruce, which is all about Bruce Springsteen and music. And it was such a fun time. That's coming out soon. So keep an eye on Twitter. And then tonight um, at time of recording, because we're recording on a Tuesday, I will be joining another uh, host of How Many on his podcast, Assume the Juxtaposition, which I love the word juxtaposition. So already I'm excited about that. So yeah, keep an eye on Twitter for both of those episodes. I've got a couple more guest spots coming up and just thank you. Again, I, I, I just, ah, uh, I'm so happy. Um, anyway, uh, yes, our socials. We are at Not Again Pod. Uh, if you'd like to tweet at us, we really do welcome it. We want to hear your thoughts about the show anytime. 
I am at Bex Goose. Uh, that would be B-E-X-G-O-O-S. If you want to find your next favorite podcast or get a podcast review from me, you can check out the tweet that's pinned to my profile. Um, we do have a Patreon. It is patreon.com slash potato lady. And we have a Kofi if you want to buy us a tip. It's ko ficom slash not again. No exclamation point in that. So thank you so much to everybody for listening. Thank you for helping us to maintain our marbles for one more week. And we will see you next time for part two of our talk about autism spectrum disorder. Bye. Bye, friends.